What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. My name is Nick, also known as Clickwid, and I am joined today by my partner in crime, Dustin, also known as Project KSL. Week one of the NFL season is now in the books, but now is when fantasy seasons can really be made or broken. Now, a lot of people are going to be overreacting to what happened in week one, but we are here to be your voice of reason. We are here to help you make the right decisions going forward and hopefully guide you to a fantasy championship at the end of the season. Now, today's episode is going to be focused on some of the trends and developing situations that we noticed in week one, and we are also here to give you some suggestions for your waiver wire if you're looking to make some improvements to your team after week one. But the first thing that we are going to talk about today is the situation that's on everybody's mind, the thing that everybody is talking about, and that is, of course, the Ray Rice situation out in Baltimore. Now, for those of you who've been living under a rock and (laughs) haven't had it on ESPN at all today on your TV, didn't watch Monday Night Football, well, Ray Rice was actually suspended by the NFL today indefinitely after the, the Baltimore Ravens actually cut him. And the reason for that is because of a heinous video that came out today that showed him knocking out his then fiance with a punch. And uh, that's something that TMZ leaked. It's absolutely ridiculous. And uh, Dustin, I want to get your thoughts on this. Do you, I mean, do you think that the NFL and the Baltimore Ravens handled this situation correctly? Well, I mean, it depends when who you believe about when the video was out there i mean a lot of people were saying that the nfl had this video before they made this judgment and if that's the case they completely missed it i mean it should have been a lifetime ban from the minute they saw that video but yeah John actually Hart- uh tmz is reporting uh that they're gonna have information tomorrow that proves that the nfl had access to this the nfl is yeah. reporting that they did not have this video prior to today or prior to what was it yeah was it prior to yeah. today yeah john know. harbaugh is saying that today was the first day he saw it and that's what caused the reaction but i mean i don't know yeah. It's kind of bad when you consider they had that whole press conference set up and his wife's next to him and his wife is saying that they should forgive her. It's just it's such a big fucking mess, the whole thing. Yeah, it's it's a whole – I mean, I'm not going to get on a soapbox right now and talk about domestic violence, but uh, it's a bad situation. And, uh, I mean, the, the NFL did the right thing by indefinitely suspending Ray Rice, and uh, the Ravens definitely did the right thing by – uh, releasing him today, but the the real question, I guess, is you know, did they do it in, in a I timely say, did, did they did they only do it because the TMZ video was out there? Yeah, I mean, because that's, that, that's what most people thing. think, and if that's that's they handled it terribly. But and if TMZ does prove that the NFL had this information prior to uh or to this video anyway, yeah. prior to the the today. I think that heads I mean, have to roll. I'm going to say, I mean, yeah, Roger Goodell board. might legitimately get might get. I mean, I don't know, fired. They might have to step down if this really really expands into saying this is a big cover-up of having this video yeah that i mean that would just be ridiculous but i mean it's obviously the thing that we want to focus on in this whole situation i i don't want to sit and talk too much about uh the ray rice situation because it's just it's such a sad situation yeah. but what i do want to talk about is the baltimore ravens running back situation which which we actually got a little bit of a taste of this week in week one um they went up against the cincinnati Bengals, and i think a lot of people including both of us were a little bit surprised to see that justin forsett not Bernard Pierce, led the team with 11 attempts for 70 yards, and he also scored a touchdown. So, Dustin, uh, the question in this one is, are you buying Justin Forsett as the Ravens running back going forward, or are you still a believer in Bernard Pierce? I still think Bernard Pierce is going to be the guy to own. If you, I mean, it, if you want to, if you're really invested in the Baltimore backfield, if you really went in on all, if you really went all in on Ray Rice and thinking the Kubiak zone blocking, I still think that, Bernard Pierce, at the end of the season, is going to be the guy that's getting the majority of touches because he's the best back. We've seen Justin Forsett for years, you know. I mean, he was in Seattle years and years and years ago. He went to Houston for a while. Mm-hmm. But we know what he is. He's he's nothing special. He's never been nothing special. I mean, they have a rookie that, depending on who you ask, they either really like or they don't really care about. And, I mean, we've seen what Bernard Pierce can do. Bernard Pierce can be a productive running back in the NFL. We've seen it. Yeah. So I still think that in all likelihood, you know, he fumbled. They pulled him out of the game. People were freaking out about that. They did the same thing to Ray Rice. Kubiak did the same thing to Arian Foster sometimes. I don't think you should re- overreact to that too much. I still think Bernard Pierce is the guy you want to own. Yeah, and I think I pretty much agree with that. I mean, uh, he he did look okay prior to uh, the the fumble. I don't – I mean – 
he didn't look horrible. He wasn't running with that same fire that we would expect out of somebody who's trying to win the job. But uh, at the same time, I think Bernard Pierce, like you said, is the guy to own in this offense. Justin Forsett is not going to be some guy that you're relying on for your fantasy team going forward. Yeah, he could have a few games here and there. Like, if if there was the situation that he somehow is the Ravens running back going forward and Bernard Pierce is just a, a shadow of what we expected him to be, uh, I just don't think Bernard, or I don't think uh, Justin Fournette, Forsett is the guy that you want to own and rely on for fantasy purposes. So, uh, yeah, this whole situation just isn't good. Um, if Bernard Pierce is the guy, I still think that he has value. If it's Justin yeah, Forsett, absolutely. just don't bother. Well, don't I mean, bother you also have to offense. think about you know, there's Lorenzo Taliaferro, who was the guy that they drafted in the fourth round this year mm-hmm. out of Coastal Carolina, and he, you know, he's a big back too. He's, I mean, he's two twenty five, he's six foot, he's, so he's a big back too. So we could, he could be the running back for a Baltimore Ravens offense, but it's just going to be a matter of, do you really put that kind of pressure, that kind of role for a guy that's just stepping in when you have Bernard Pierce already an established running back on the roster? Yeah, I and, just, and, I don't see it. And the big thing for fantasy purposes are, is basically, is this guy even valuable? I mean, if Justin Forsett has the job, I just don't still, I still don't really think he's somebody that you're really yeah, excited no matter, about. Yeah, if, if, even if Justin Forsett's seen the majority of the carries, it's still going to be a running back by committee. So there then you it's go. your pick your poison no matter what. There you go. So, Let's move on to the next situation, which is another uh, team that is in that division, and that is the the Cleveland Browns. Now, the Cleveland Browns are in another tough-to-read situation, especially yeah. after what happened in Week 1, and that was that Ben Tate left Sunday's game with a knee injury after having just six carries. Six carries for uh, for Bernard Pierce before he fumbled, six carries for Ben Tate before he injured his <laughs> it's knee. A trend. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a trend. But anyway, after Ben Tate went out, the Browns continued to run the ball pretty effectively, actually. actually, A pair of rookies, Terrence West and Isaiah Crowell, stepped up, and the Browns' offense really didn't miss a beat. I mean, they they came back in that game, actually, in the second half and made it a, a close one in yeah, the end. Yeah, Hoyer was wheeling and dealing there in the second half. Yeah, exactly. And and uh, the, what ended up happening is that West ended up rushing for 100 yards on 16 carries. But the frustrating thing and the thing that makes this whole thing confusing is that Crowell actually scored both of the team's rushing touchdowns. So we don't know the status of Ben T- Tate's knee at this at this moment, I guess. But Dustin, if you're someone who owns Ben Tate, are you going out there and looking for an insurance policy? And are you going to be looking at Terrence West or Isaiah Crowell as a guy that you're actually considering picking up in any fantasy leagues? I mean, first off, I don't think the Cleveland running back situation is going to be that productive for the whole year regardless. So if you're in a guy and you absolutely are locked into Ben Tate, you're just hell-bent on saying, I have to start Ben Tate every week because I drafted so-and-so high or however you, your draft shook out. But I, I think if I had to, I'd probably pick Terrence West up just because I think, you know, they, the Browns put a higher premium on him. He looked really good. You know, a lot of times people overanalyze just getting the TDs. Yep. I mean, I, I mean, there's some rumors that say the Browns have always been really high on Isaiah Crowell, but... I still would tend to think that Terrence West would be the way to go. It seemed they gave him the majority of the work, you know, and a lot of times goal line TDs can just be situational things where he just needed a break and it's just bad luck for him. Yeah, I completely agree. Terrence West is the guy that you're looking for in this Cleveland Browns offense if there's a situation where Ben Tate does go down and he is going to miss significant time. So uh, being that we don't know, uh, come back and check with us later this week because we should have a better analysis as far as this whole situation goes. But for right now, if you're in a 12-team, a 14-team league where there is not much running back depth out there, Guys, if if uh, if West is out there right now oh, yeah. you on your waiver wire, you have to go out there and get him. Make him a high waiver wire priority because honestly, there aren't a ton of guys that really broke out as being you know explosive guys that we're expecting to do well going forward. Terrence so was I good in college that, too. I mean, he's yeah, not, I mean, Towson, exactly. he was a really good running back. So exactly, I mean, the the skills are there. The question is, like Dustin said, is the Cleveland Browns running back situation one that you want to really invest highly in? And the, the answer to that really should be, you know, did you invest in it when Ben Tate was the guy? Yeah, Because exactly. I don't really think that Ben Tate is a guy that people should have been investing too heavily. And you shouldn't <laughs> be so excited about having Ben Tate in your lineup that you don't have depth on your fantasy roster. But if for whatever reason you are in that situation, I do think Terrence West has to be somebody that you look for and, and possibly make him the number one guy on your waiver wire class yeah. this week because – it's just it's something that you're going to need. Ben yep. Tate has a history of injuries and you know you really need to have that insurance policy. So, 
Let's move on to the third running back situation that we want to look <laughs> at this week, and that is the New Orleans Saints. Now, the New Orleans Saints is a situation that if you guys have listened to or read our tweets and you listened to our po- podcast earlier uh, this past week, you know that Dustin and I typically do not trust the New Orleans offense. And that's not to say that we don't think it's one of the best offenses. For in the running NFL. backs. It yeah. is. It absolutely is. But we don't trust anyone outside of Drew Brees, Jimmy Graham, and maybe Marcus Colston. Hey, sometimes Colston. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Other than that, it's just it's such a crapshoot every single week. And the reason for it is because we see so many games like this. I mean, in Sunday's loss to the Falcons, New Orleans used all three of their top running backs. Mark Ingram, Pierre Thomas, Kyrie Robinson, and all of them got significant touches. Kyrie Robinson scored a touchdown. Pierre Thomas had 13 touches for 89 total yards, a pretty typical Pierre Thomas game. And Mark Ingram, who we've who we've been writing off for years. I've, I think yeah. everybody has. I'm the biggest Mark Ingram hater ever. Yeah, exactly. And and he had 60 yards rushing and scored two touchdowns. Yep. So, Dustin, I know we both like Pierre Thomas in, as a flex in PPR, PPR. leagues. Yep. But are we buying Mark Ingram as a legitimate running back going forward? You know, I, I'm buying him a lot more than I had in the, than I have in the past. I mean, I'll tell you that because, I mean, just, just watching him, it seems like he's finally running without just immediately looking to run into his own offensive lineman like he's done for the year. So I I, I think so. Again, I, I'm not going to rely on Mark Ingram to be a week-to-week consistent score because I still think there's a good chance that they're just like, oh, we're going to throw Kyrie Robinson out there and he's going to vulture the TD. You know, even if Mark Ingram is <laughs> yep. going, I still think that's a, a serious possibility every single week. So again, I, I, I am a, I'm higher on Mark Ingram than I was three days ago. But I'm sure. not still super excited about marking him. I still think Pierre Thomas would be the back I'd want to own in PPR. Yeah, and I, I pretty much agree with that as well. Um, I, I feel like Mark Ingram is going to be more utilized than people realized going into the season, ourselves included, I think. Yeah. Uh, after week one, we saw that the Saints, when they got down into the red zone, they were not afraid to run the ball. And that's something that they really have not done a lot of. Um, Mm -hmm. They had Reggie Bush, who had a a double-digit touchdown year. But aside from that, they really have not had a running back score a significant number of touchdowns for them in quite some time that I can remember anyway. Uh, I mean, obviously, Darren Sproles had some nice receiving touchdowns, but running the ball in the red zone for New Orleans just has not been something that was has been a priority in the past. And I think that with Mark Ingram, uh, we've been hearing throughout training camp that he looks like a different guy. And if, if that's true and what we saw on Sunday is true, I think that Mark Ingram is a guy that you could at least go out there and you could try him out as a flex. If you're, yep. if you're in a situation where Ben Tate was your flex, you know, a guy like that or, you know, for God forbid, Reece you somehow Jones had Ray, Ray Rice yeah. or, you know, Bernard Pierce or, you know, one of these guys who you're just not, we're not 100% sure on right now. I kind of like Mark Ingram. I kind of think that he has some value. Obviously, he's not going to catch any passes. Uh, that's just not his role in the offense. So uh, look for him to put up Alfred Morris-like numbers in the receiving game. But, <laughs> I, I mean, as far as guys with a potential touchdown from week to week, there aren't that many guys that have a better opportunity. Yeah, absolutely, in that offense especially. And, I, I mean, it, it does finally seem like Sean Payton finally has confidence in him. Yeah. Before you see him get subbed off so much, even if Mark Kim would get, you know, get – 20 yards on three carries, he'd still sub him right back off. Pierre Thomas, Darren Sproul, somebody back, like right back out there. But it seems like Peyton finally is showing some confidence in Mark Ingram to be on the field. So let me ask you this then. For for Kyrie Robinson, who, like we said, scored a touchdown. He didn't really do a whole lot for yardage, but he did score a touchdown in the red right. zone. It wasn't it wasn't a goal line touchdown. It wasn't from the one yard line or anything like that. But I think it was like a 12 yard run or something like that. But uh, for him, are you considering Kyrie Robinson if you're in, let's say, a 14-team league? Is he somebody that you're going out and picking up right now? No. I, I mean, even in a 14-team, I don't think there's going to be any consistency to Kyrie Robinson. I think he's pretty much only going to be there to be a change of pace kind of guy if, if Mark Ingram needs a break and Pierre Thomas needs a break. I really don't think that you're ever going to be able to point in the entire season where it's like, bar an injury, of course, that I could be like, I'm starting Kyrie Robinson in any format, and I feel pretty good he'll at least get me a decent amount of points where he won't be a complete detriment to my team that week. <laughs> and, he, and he might have, I mean, the thing is Chris Ivory used to even have those kind of games where it's like, Oh man, Chris Ivory ran for 120 this week. And next week he'd run for eight. Yeah. So I, I think it, his best case scenario is sort of that, but there's no yeah. consistency. Uh, I completely agree. Kyrie Robinson is not at this point, somebody who is on my fantasy radar as somebody that I'm really considering picking up. I mean, obviously if you're in, 
a 16 team league where every position is at a premium. I mean, you got to try, I guess, but he's not somebody that your average fantasy owner should be considering at this point. So let's move on now from a running back situation that looked pretty good in week one to three running backs who (laughs) kind of looked like crap in week one. And these are guys that we drafted number one, number two, and number three overall in almost every single draft. All of them were pretty uninspiring. We had LaShawn McCoy, Jamal Charles, and Adrian Peterson all pretty much drop an egg for their fantasy owners in week one. Now, LaShawn McCoy did go over 100 total yards, so it wasn't all bad, but Adrian Best Peterson world, and Jamal certainly. Charles looked just awful. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if it was situational or what. But Dustin, are you concerned about these guys going forward, or is it just a case of a tough week, tough defenses that they went up against? I mean, what, what's what happened with these guys? You know, I, I'll, I'll say this: I, I'm not concerned with Adrian Peterson at all. He's going to be fine. I, that offense, I think, is probably gonna be better than people thought, which will in the long term will be good for him. So I have no concern with Adrian Peterson. You start him every week, no question. LaShawn McCoy, same thing. I think they just got to a bad start in Jacksonville. They rebounded. He ended up with a decent amount in PPR. I, I think he'll be fine. Jamal Charles is the one you got to worry about because the Chiefs look, oh, my God, you're the worst team in the league bad. <laughs> the, the offensive line was the biggest train wreck. They might have the worst offensive line in football. They lost Derek Johnson. He's done for the year. The secondary is, is, would probably just get annihilated by, like, USC right now. They are a, <laughs> a horrible team. Yeah, And, I mean, I had them going 5-11 and 11 at the beginning of the year. I think if they hit that, then they've had a successful season right now. Mm-hmm. They're terrible. So, Jamal Charles, I mean, I expected from whatever he had, 18, 19 TDs last year, no matter what, I expected that to drop. But now seeing this, I'm thinking, oh, my God, is he even going to hit seven? So, factoring that in with the fact that, like, they're just not going to have that many scoring opportunities because they're so bad. I, I think Jamal Charles, I still really like in PPR because Alex Smith is a terrible quarterback. He's going to throw him the ball as many times as he can because he doesn't want to make reads. But if you're not in PPR and you have Jamal Charles, I'm probably panicking a little bit seeing, just seeing how bad the Chiefs were. Yeah, and I think that's fair. Um, you know, I, I think there's an opportunity for him to catch passes, like you said. Um, if the Chiefs do fall behind in games, which we both would agree at this point is pretty likely, and I think that the reality is starting to set in even for Chiefs fans, yeah. at least some of them. The reasonable um, ones. Yeah, which which is like 2%. Seldom, them, but three, they're, they're there. Three, 2 to 3%. But uh, <laughs> anyway, though, I, I think the, the opportunity for Jamal Charles to catch passes is there. But I don't see him scoring double-digit touchdowns this year. I actually didn't really predict that coming into the season, and that's why I had Jamal Charles as my number three. I mean, obviously, I still think he has significant value in fantasy. I'm not hitting the panic button at this point on Jamal Charles, but I'm a little bit worried. But I'm going to actually disagree with you a little bit on Adrian Peterson. And it's not that I hate Adrian Peterson or anything, but... I was expecting big things out of him this week, and, and I was really disappointed in what I saw. Yeah, I, mean, I watched a significant portion Vikings of that game. were a good team, and he was still bad. That's the part. That's the one thing you, I guess, you if there yeah. is something to be concerned about, it's that. Yeah, I mean, they scored, they won that game by 28 points. That's yep. usually a recipe for a massive yeah, fantasy day for TDs. a running back. Yeah, yeah, and and Adrian especially the Vi- with Vi- when the Vikings win games big, it's usually Adrian Peterson having a monster game. He had 75 yards. Yeah, he caught two passes. I mean, like we're not expecting massive things out of Adrian Peterson in the passing game, but I mean, my goodness, I can't believe that he wasn't more that he didn't produce more. And it him. wasn't it wasn't opportunity. They keyed he on him. He carried the ball plenty. And and obviously, yes, you focus on Adrian Peterson. I get that. But every team's going to focus on Adrian Peterson. That's yeah, that's not sure. going to change from week to week. So I'm a little bit worried about him. I mean, if he comes out and drops an egg next week, I might be looking to move him before the rest of your owners and your league catch on. Yeah. I mean, he fair looked, enough point he if it happens next week too. Good. Sure. So, so that's that's my only concern with him. Now let's move on to a guy who I'm actually buying, and that is No. Sean Moreno. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, No. Sean okay. Moreno was a top five back in 2013, and the Broncos let him walk. A lot of people were expecting Lamar Miller to be the guy in Miami, Uh, but Dustin, I mean, you're pretty familiar with Moshan Moreno. Tell me why you think he's going to hold on to this job and be a reliable fantasy running back going forward. In terms of three down backs and all around good backs in the NFL, Noshan is is up there. I mean, he's not, he's, Noshan doesn't do anything elite other than maybe pass protection, but he's very good at catching the ball. He's very good at running with the ball. He's very good at outside runs. He makes reads very well. He knows where his blocks are. He's a very, very good all-around back. And Lamar Miller's had fumbling problems in the past. 
And while maybe he isn't that is quite the home run threat that Lamar Miller is, he's better in every aspect of the game than Lamar Miller. Denver had no business letting him walk for Monty Ball, who frankly looked bad when you consider how he actually looked with your eyes on the game yeah. uh, versus the Colts. And no Sean's down there still just churning it in hundred yards versus the Patriots. Like it's nothing. He's just, a, he's just a horse. I mean, it, Everyone thought that it might be a timeshare. Nah, no Sean's not losing that role unless there's an injury. He's a serious, serious good pick for anyone that had the uh, intelligence to draft him where his ADP was because he was getting severely underdrafted in leagues. Yeah, he was going behind Lamar Miller in yeah. the leagues, most leagues, frankly. So I think that the the value is obviously there uh, for those of us who saw no Sean Moreno uh, as what he really was last year for Denver, which was. Crazy not underrated. A, yeah, I mean, not a superstar by any means, but a guy who was productive yep. in an offense that was moving the football. And and if Miami is able to do even a, a shadow of what they were able to do against they the Patriots better, in too. the passing game. Yeah, they I looked mean, better. Tannehill did. The, yeah, the exactly. New Tannehill looked, looked good. Yeah. And quite frankly, with I don't, I don't mean to sound crazy, but Mike Wallace kind of owned Darrell Revis. So Woo. if Mike Wallace... If Mike Wallace looks like he did this past Sunday from week to week, I think that's a good thing for Noshan Moreno because it's going to put the Miami offense in the red zone and it's going to give Noshan Moreno the opportunity to score touchdowns. Yeah, love and we Noshan saw going last forward. week. We saw last season that he is able to score touchdowns. So absolutely love Noshan Moreno going forward. I think he is a reliable RB three at at worst. At worst, potentially yeah. an RB a high end RB two. So He's got I some like RB one upside Moreno. too. Yeah, I think he could from week to it's week. It's limited, um, but yeah, I mean it. I, I, mean, I don't like him over guys like Giovanni Bernard, Demarco Murray, and, and those kind of guys who sure, are going as, as RB ones. But I still think he's a, val- a very valuable fantasy a lot of player, and, he, for his and he's going to give you. Yeah, for his ADP, he's going to give you. He's definitely going to return that so long as he doesn't get hurt. So yeah. another player that I'm really liking, and, and I want to talk a little bit about buy lows because this is kind of the focus for why we're doing a podcast early in the week. And we're going to also do one at the end of the week where we talk about the matchups a little bit more. But the reason that I want to talk about these buy lows is because they can really help you grow your team if you had struggles in week one. So one guy that I'm really liking a lot is actually Noshan Moreno's former teammate, Demarius Thomas. Yeah, like now, I, I'm not sure that a lot of people are overly worried about Demarius after just one game, but I, I honestly feel like this is the lowest point that he will be at all season. I mean, he caught only four passes for 48 yards on Sunday. And Dustin, you know that oh, yeah. he is wor- <laughs> he is way better than that. And he had a lot of drops that game. He just had a bad exactly. night. Yeah, he exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, the positive from this whole game is that he was targeted 11 game or 11 times in the game. Yep. And I I can't overlook that. 11 times in a game by Peyton Manning. I mean, he didn't lose faith in him despite the fact that he was dropping passes, despite the fact that they weren't connecting. And I just don't think he could play any worse than he did on Sunday. I still think he is a lock to be an elite wide receiver for the rest of the season. Yep. I mean, and when I say elite, I'm talking like top five. Okay, I top think five, he's going to be three. an absolute monster this season. Mm-hmm. And I know this might sound crazy to some people, but I'm telling you, if you have somebody like Antonio Brown who's coming off of a big game and is he looked really, really good. I mean, the, the karate kick to the face on the punter was awesome. <laughs> He's all Jesus. over sports center right now, right? I think there are some leagues where you can move him for Demarius Thomas right yeah, now. Some might some people might take that. And I like that. I mean, if you can t- if you can get Demarius Thomas on the cheap er, on the cheap for an Antonio Brown like who st- who I still like, don't get me wrong, I still think Antonio Brown's a top 10 wide receiver especially in PPR. Yeah. But definitely. Demarius Thomas has that upside to just blow the league up for you. And I don't think Antonio Brown quite has that type of talent. So that's why I'm saying Demarius Thomas is one of my guys who I think you have to buy low on, mm-hmm. and he's just going to be an absolute monster. Dustin, who is your buy low guy for this week? There's a couple I think that I identified. The first one was Keenan Allen after the game he just had. <laughs> yeah. he, I mean, yeah, he had a bad game in Arizona, and he had that yep. drop at the end of the game that's going to be stuck in people's heads. I, I still think Keenan Allen is – I mean, he's, an, he's damn near an elite route runner at this point. He gets separation. He's not that fast. You know, he's, he doesn't, he's not going to burn anybody, but he gets open. And he destroyed some teams last year. Like Kansas City, he ruined their lives. And he I did. still – yeah, I still think there's going to be a huge – he's still going to be in for a big year in San Diego. I think that's going to be a very productive offense. I, I think that – They did look great, though, on Monday night. Cardinals are a good defense, man. I mean, Pat, I mean, he was also – Patrick Peterson shadowed him for a lot of the game. Patrick Very Peterson's true. an elite corner. I think there's a whole lot of upside with a guy like that still. And some might, people might just be like, no, I'm, I'm terrified of him now. 
because yep. he did that to me. I think there will be a lot of people who are benching Keenan Allen next week. Yeah, exactly. And, and sitting him for a guy like, I, I mean, I, I don't mean to throw out just random names, but I mean, like sitting him for a guy who broke out like an Alan Hearns, yeah, you know, exactly. or, you know, something like that, where it's like Keenan Allen didn't do much for me in week one. I'm going to overreact. Don't do that. Yep, do don't not be, that, be guy. that guy. Yep. Don't be that guy. So we talked about buy lows. Do you have somebody else you want to mention? No, I, th- I think okay. that's it. Okay. So let's talk about then sell highs because selling high is every bit as important as buying low. Yeah, so, absolutely. So who are your sell highs this week? Number one I have is Steve Smith because I I don't think Steve Smith is that good. <laughs> he had 15 targets. He had seven catches. I mean, Joe Flacco threw the ball like 60 times. I That you have to think that doesn't happen again if the Ravens even want to win, even want to win four games this year. The Ravens just look distraught. They look terrible. So yep. I, I think that, that that in all likelihood is not going to be replicated. We know what Steve Smith is at this point. We know what Joe Flacco is at this point. Dennis Pitta also caught a 1,000 balls that game. I don't see that happening. And then another guy just, I mean, not necessarily a sell high, but if I own RG3 in any leagues, I am offering him up for whatever I can get because holy shit, that guy looks bad. <laughs> yeah, he, he looks all-time bad right now. And, I mean... I, I honestly think after seeing that game, and, and unfortunately, I, I will say, not going into this season, uh, I wasn't super high on RG3, but I I feel like I feel like the talent is there somewhere. Oh, it's just like, I, I don't know if it's like in his head at this point, or I don't know what the situation is. You, or, you really wonder what playing on that knee did to him, man, because you could yeah. tell his knee was never right the entire last year, and, and he played on it anyways, and he's and, just looked like shit ever since. That's the big thing for me is he – I think he had two yards rushing. Yeah. I mean two yards rushing is the type of numbers that we expect out of Peyton Manning where Carson it's Palmer. like, okay, yeah. he, he <laughs> scrambled and like stepped out of bounds when he when he bootlegged one play or something, you know, and he gained a, a, a random two yards on accident practically. That's what we got out of RG3. And you draft RG3 with the idea that he's going to potentially yeah, play 100 yards for you at some point. And yeah, that's just rushing. not going to happen. No, they're trying to keep point. him in the pocket. They're not letting him move at all. Yeah. So if you're not so, if you're not counting on any rushing and he's just not a good passer, so get rid of him for whatever you can get. If anyone offers you anything, you move him. I I completely agree. Now I will say one thing about that offense. Just one quick thing, Pierre Garcon, man, he looks freaking awesome still. Oh yeah. I don't know how he's, he's still productive blanket. in that offense, but yeah. man, he looks really really good, and I'm I'm loving Pierre Garcon right now. Yeah. But for me, selling high, and this is one who uh, I we've talked a little bit about two guys who. Uh, well, one guy, Steve Smith, who blew it up, and another guy who, uh, RG3, who both these guys we weren't really expecting a whole lot of coming into the season. But for me, a guy who had a ton of hype coming into the season was Cordero Patterson from the Minnesota yeah, Vikings. absolutely. New Josh Gordon, everyone's mine. Yeah, he's he's the new Josh Gordon, guys. He's going to tear it up. Okay, look, week one. If you had him in your fantasy lineup, you are happy as hell. The guy had a big <laughs> game. He had what? Uh a hundred and something yards of total offense. He scored a touchdown. But guys, this situation is not something that is going to happen every week. The guy had a 70-yard touchdown run. Touchdown run. Do you think that that is something that is even moderately sustainable? Yeah, no, it's no just, chance. It's not. I'm sorry. And it's not like it was like some crazy end around where they faked it to Adrian Peterson. No, Cordero Patterson lined up in the backfield and took a pitch. Yep. I mean, it's he's nasty like, though, but yeah, 70 yards. Super, TD super happen. talented. Don't get me wrong. But the bottom line is that you draft Cordero Patterson because you think that he's going to be a big time receiver. Okay. I want you to look past that 70 yard touchdown run and just imagine for some reason that they he gets tackled for got a three yard gain or something. Yeah. It gets tackled or they had a false start on that play because the people, the guys were too excited in the huddle and they just <laughs> couldn't, you know, they couldn't get it down or, you know, whatever. But look, Imagine that that happened, that 70-yard touchdown run was negated, okay? Just just try and put it out of your mind. He had three catches for 26 yards in that game. Three catches for 26 yards. They won that game by 28 points. Guys, if you think that Cordero Patterson is a wide receiver one right now, you are out of your freaking mind. Yep. I'm sorry. Cordero Patterson has the skills, but Matt Castle is that team's quarterback right now. I mean, there is not going to be wide receiver one upside out of anybody in that offense. I'm sorry. It's just not going to happen. He had five targets on the day. Five targets is the type of numbers that you would expect out of a a wide receiver three 
for most teams. So I don't like Cordero Patterson. I, I don't like him going forward as far as where his current value is. I think that you can sell him yeah, for a in love good with number right now. I think you can get a lot for him. I would absolutely recommend it. I, I don't see this type of production being sustainable for him in this offense. So with that being said, I want to continue to talk about players who are ones that you should be thinking about adding to your offense. So let's look at the waiver wire acquisitions for this week. Big time guys who te- tore it up in week one and guys who are stepping into good situations for whatever reason, starting off with the Jacksonville Jaguars who for half of football looked like they were a pretty legitimate team. (laughs) And (laughs) I mean, they were blowing out the Philadelphia Eagles in the first half of that football game. And that came a lot because of their two rookie wide receivers, Alan Hearns and Marquise Lee. Now, Alan Hearns actually made four catches for 110 yards and two touchdowns in that game. while Marquise Lee made six catches for 62 yards. The targets were interesting. Alan Hearns had nine. Marquise Lee had 10. So it was pretty well distributed, but the the real question here is is Alan Hearns the guy that you want a, a guy that you want to pick up, or is Marquise Lee a guy you want to pick up, or are we both or are both of them kind of being overhyped at this point? And Cecil sure. Shorts is supposed to be back soon, so yeah, exactly. You know what what's the situation in your eyes? I think that I, I think if I had to pick between Marquise Lee or Alan Hearns, I'd probably pick Alan Hearns because he was super productive in the preseason. Mm-hmm. He has elite speed, and the Jaguars just raved about him all camp. It seems like he really, really has found a niche there. So I think that if I had to choose between those two, I'd choose him over Marquise Lee, frankly. But Cecil Schwartz wasn't there. Cecil Schwartz is going to come in. He's going to have his role in that offense. They're very high on Cecil Schwartz still. Yep. And Cecil Schwartz is a good receiver. And I mean, and Henny's he played with Cecil Schwartz in the past, too. So I think that you have to keep your expectations to a, uh, a minimum with those kind of guys. I would not be starting them next week until we see more. I mean, if Alan Hearns goes out there for the next three weeks and keeps dropping these TDs and big yard games, then yeah. I mean, you probably can, but after one week, I would not be the guy that's out there starting him immediately. You really got to wait and see with a player like that, especially on a team like Jacksonville. I completely agree. I think that you're you're tentative about a guy like Alan Hearns. Um, I definitely like him more than Marquise Lee at this point, despite the fact that Marquise Lee was targeted second round one pick. more time. Yeah, and he was a second um, round pick too. Yeah, and he was the higher draft pick as well. So... I mean, at this point, we've seen that happen before. Um, I mean, we can go all the way back to the point where I, I believe it was Bryant Johnson and Anquan Bolden were drafted in the same draft class one, yeah. at one Anquan point. Anquan Bolden just tore it up. Yeah, and Anquan Bolden had one of the best rookie wide receiver seasons of all time, and Bryant Johnson was pretty much somebody that you could completely forget about. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it, it, we've seen these situations happen before, and it's not out of the question that one rookie outshines another in training camp, despite the fact that he was drafted significantly yeah, later. Yeah, I mean, it happens it, all the time. You can't teach speed, and Alan Hearns is fast as hell, so. Yeah, there you go. So, I mean, that that's something that I, I think that if you're in a, a 12-team league, Alan Hearns might be somebody to look at. But yeah, if pick you're in a 10-team but... league, if you're in an 8-team league, eh. I'm not super excited about it. I mean, obviously, if you've got somebody on your roster that just dropped a goose egg on you that you weren't excited about in the first place, go ahead and drop them and and take a chance on Alan Hearns. Worth a shot, certainly. But don't be expecting anything. Don't send him out there next week and then complain when he goes three catches and 30 yards. Just don't do it. (laughs) Just don't expect anything out of him at this point. I think you'll be okay. So let's move on to somebody that you are pretty high on and somebody that I'm not so sure on. (laughs) Uh, And that's Benny Cunningham of the St. Louis Rams. I I know he touched the ball nine times to Zach Stacey's 11 this past week, but tell me more about what you like about Benny Cunningham, Dustin. I think Benny Cunningham's a little bit of an underrated running back, to be honest with you. I mean, I was I was the guy in the preseason that was thinking, I don't like Zach Stacy. I don't like him for his ADP. I didn't think the Rams were going to be that good as far as scoring the ball. And now with the way the Rams look versus the Vikings getting blown out like that, I think it really might come down to the guy, who do you want in the passing game? And Benny, Benny, Benny Cunningham is going to get the role in the passing game every single day over Zach Stacy. Again, I'm not dropping Zach Stacy or anything. I'm not panicking. You have to wait. You have to see what it plays out a little bit more. But I certainly think at this point right now, with the touches being that close, I think Benny Cunningham has to be rostered with an eye of thinking, like, if they really go down the drain and you are relying on the St. Louis backfield for your fantasy squad, Benny Cunningham should probably be rostered just to see what happens with him in the passing game and Zach Stacy, frankly, and how the touches distribute throughout the rest of the year. 
what do you think is the realistic possibility that Benny Cunningham is the the better to own fantasy player going forward between the two of them? I mean, what would you give the odds? Would you say there's a a ten percent chance I, that I happens? Mean, Fifty. It it all depends how the Rams season shakes out. I mean, if the Rams are an abysmal team, if they don't get a quarterback and it's Austin Davis and Sean Hill, and you're looking at them being down in all these games. Zach Stacy is not a three-down back. He cannot play at three-down role. So you have Benny Cunningham out there who can catch passes. He's not bad in pass, bro. You can throw him out there, and, you know, he's probably going to catch some balls, and he's probably going to make some yards. Again, I'm not starting him this week, but if you are tied to Zach Stacy, and in the case of a Zach Stacy injury, he's definitely the back to own. Sure. So I think that there's a, there's a good enough point to own him just for that nature. If you are heavily invested in Zach Stacy, I mean, he was going as a second, third-round pick in most leagues. Yep. which is crazy, and they look so bad. They scored six points. Yeah. Against I just, the Vikings. Yeah, against Minnesota. I just I can't see them being a great team this year. And if you're looking at any team that's that bad on offense, you're going to want the guy who's going to be out there late in the games when they're down. So I think Benny Cunningham is going to have a role in this team for the whole year. Whether or not I think he outscores, outscores Zach Stacey or anything, I don't know. I still think goal line duties, worst case scenario, Zach Stacey's going to get all of them. Zach Stacey's yeah. not a bad player. I just think that his ADP was so crazy inflated off of people just assuming things. And I think Benny Cunningham could have a role in this offense for the rest of the year. Fair enough. I, I would pretty much agree with that. Um, I, I mean, I was higher on Zach Stacy than you, obviously. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, I, I don't. I, I never viewed him as somebody that I was going to rely on as an RB2. Yeah, nothing and, wrong with you having passed that. But if you were one of those people that's... I, I'm Zach Stacy every week, RB2. That's a horrible situation for you right now. Yeah, agreed. So let's move on to another team that uh, that did fairly well on offense, all things considered, I mean, at least in the second half, and oh. that was the Cleveland Browns. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a guy there who, uh, for all intents and purposes, might be – the, the best, best receiver, the best receiver on that team, and that's Andrew Hawkins. He's a young guy, eight catches, eighty-seven yards. He was targeted ten times. Money in PPR. Yeah, and and that's the thing is, I I feel like there isn't a lot to love about the Cleveland Browns right now. Um, well, Hoyer, Hoyer didn't look bad the second half. Hoyer looked pretty good. He looked okay, but you're not going to start Brian Hoyer in a fantasy league. Oh no. <laughs> so I mean, from a fantasy standpoint, there's not a lot to love about this team. I mean, we talked a little bit about the running back situation and, and how you you kind of have to hope that something comes out of that. As far as receivers go, Jordan Cameron is already hurt. Uh, yep. We don't really know yeah, what the situation is too. on that. But uh, we do know that Andrew Hawkins led the team. We do know that he had eight catches for 87 yards. And no one else on the entire team made more than two catches on Sunday. So yep. I think that that's significant. Uh, I mean, I'm not expecting him to be the next Josh Gordon by any means, but I different think player, that, but yeah, yeah. And, and I'm, I'm I'm just using it for an example on the same team. But I, I feel like if there's somebody outside of whoever the running back is that you want to own in this offense, I, I think it's got to be Andrew Hawkins yeah, at this point. I completely agree. I, I don't love Jordan Cameron right now. Um, I mean, the injury is a major concern. I wasn't super spectacularly high on him to begin with. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have to keep in mind going into last year, uh, Jordan Cameron had done nothing. Yeah. He was an unknown former basketball player. The only reason that Jordan Cameron had any real hype about him was that he was going into an offense that uses tight ends a lot. That offense has changed in Cleveland now. And and I still think that Jordan Cameron has value if he's, if he's, uh, uh, not injured, but considering the fact that he is hurt. I think that Andrew Hawkins has a real opportunity to be a decent PPR depth receiver. If you're in a big league where you start three wide receivers and a flex, you know, he could be your wide receiver or your flex. Yeah. Uh, your wide receiver three or your flex. Let's talk about another guy who could potentially fill that role, and that's a guy from San Diego. We yep, were a little bit guy. disappointed in what we saw in Keenan Allen. Uh, but, I mean, obviously you, you like Keenan Allen going forward, but you yep. like the whole San Diego offense going forward. And yep. there's another guy there at wide receiver who you're pretty high on right now. Yeah, I'm I'm really high on Malcolm Floyd, like straight up. I, I think that you can't teach chemistry between players a lot of times. And those guys, Philip Rivers and Malcolm Floyd have chemistry. They play together forever. And any time Malcolm Floyd's been on the field, he's seen targets. He's seen a good majority of targets from Philip Rivers. He was targeted uh, more than Keenan Allen. Straight up. He? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, he had more catches. I, or no, was he at the same amount, or was he one less? Uh, I'm not sure. Either way, he caught the TD, and he was yeah. targeted. I mean, Philip Rivers threw to him a lot. So I 
I think that he's certainly a guy, if I have a high, or I mean, not even a super high waiver order, but if I need wide receiver help and I'm looking for a guy I have to start this week, I'd probably prefer to start Malcolm Floyd over a guy like Alan Hearns for week two. I think you can count a lot more consistency out of that guy. I mean, there's also, I mean, especially considering Ladarius Green, like a complete non-factor. Antonio Gates is still out there doing good. And I think it's going to be Antonio Gates, Malcolm Floyd, Keenan Allen are going to be the guys to own in that offense for receivers and tight ends. I think it's really interesting that you brought that up about him over Alan Hearns. And the reason that I say that is because Malcolm Floyd has been a guy who has been hyped up for years and years and years. I mean, all the way back to when Vincent Jackson was yeah, when he left. one of the top receivers in the league. And he was there, and he was performing at a high level. And we were like, okay, well, this guy, Malcolm Floyd, looks like he's a pretty good compliment to Vincent Jackson. And then it just never panned out. And then right. Vincent Jackson left. And then everybody was like, oh, he's going to step in and take the Vincent Jackson role. And it never happened. And then he was hurt. And now we see that he is still an important part of this offense. And the question, I think, to me is you you're high on Malcolm Floyd you think that he's somebody that you could own um how confident are you to start him I mean like where where would you rate him I mean if you're in a 10 team league let's say is he somebody that you start as a wide receiver three is he a top 30 receiver this week this week who do they play this week who does San Diego have this week I don't know. I'm, I mean, just I'm saying just not general? necessarily. I mean, I'm talking. Yeah, I'm talking about going. I mean, going forward, is is Malcolm Floyd somebody that you're relying on as a top thirty receiver? I mean, no, probably not. But I, I, I it wouldn't surprise me if he is that though. It really wouldn't because, like I said, he has the repertoire already. With he already has that with Philip Rivers. Okay, sure. And I, I could certainly see. I mean, maybe I'm wrong on Keen Allen, and you shouldn't buy him. But I, I think that that offense is going to be good enough to sustain those guys. The only thing about Malcolm, only thing you have to worry about with Malcolm Floyd is that he's been hurt a lot. True. So, I mean, if you are going out there and get him, I don't think it's that big of a risk, no matter what, because he's a waiver wire guy for week one. So if you get him and he doesn't pan out, it's not that big of a deal. So you know. You're, but you're telling me though that you would have him higher on your waiver priority than Alan Hearns for week one. Yeah. No, I probably would. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I, I mean, I'm going to say that I disagree with that, but only because I've seen what Malcolm Floyd is. And I, I believe that Malcolm Floyd is, and this is, comes back to a f- fantasy philosophy that I have. And that is that we kind of know what Malcolm Floyd is, and he's going to be a consistent pass catcher. He's going to be a guy who puts up decent numbers, but he's going to disappear a lot of times. Okay. And the question to me then is, is he somebody that I really want to put in my fantasy lineup? Let's say he gets me 10 points a week. Okay, 10 points a week, not bad, but it's never really going to put me over the edge. It, it just and, it really depends what your situation is like. Right. I mean, if, if you are out there and you're drafting guys that are just all falling apart on you early on and you or you really didn't put any type of precedent on getting good wide receivers, I mean, if you're out there week one and you're starting a guy like – uh, let's say you're out there week one and you're starting a guy like um, Doug Baldwin or something, you know, like Doug Baldwin and uh, Aaron Dobson are your receivers or something. Like I could certainly see you getting a guy like Malcolm Floyd and being like, you know what? Yeah. I, I feel like I could start him, but yeah. if those that have a good right, I mean, if you have like an Alshon Jeffrey and a uh, Percy Harvin and even an Eric Decker, like, no, I'm not playing over any of a caliber of that kind of guy. Yeah, and that's that's the situations that I'm trying to portray here because I think that if you're in a situation like that where you have good wide receivers and you don't need to rely on this guy every week, yeah, no, I, I like a them. guy who has a little bit more upside like an Alan Hearns. Yeah, Hearns has more upside, absolutely. He has a whole lot so, more downside, I think, too, though. Yeah, and that's the big thing. He does have the downside of never again catching a pass basically yeah. <laughs> so i mean that that's the unfortunate situation with a guy like that but sometimes you got to take those chances you know um not a lot of people were super high on keenan allen coming into last year but guess what keenan allen balled out so as a whole lot were a lot better than people expected last year too true 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 but uh, i mean that that's the kind of thing though you you have to take those chances from time to time um i'm i'm not super high on Al- alan hearns but i think that those are the kind of guys who can potentially yeah, make we're taking a shot on season. there's no doubt absolutely I, I don't really see malcolm floyd being that i mean so, history tells there's a guy every year i mean yeah. peyton hillis victor cruz you know whoever it may be jordan cameron J- julius thomas there's a guy every single year after week one that gets picked up in the majority of leagues and he's probably going to have a really good shot to win your league because there's just a guy like that every single year. Yep. So, I mean, Alan Hurts might be that guy. I mean, Andrew Hawkins might be that guy. Benny Cunningham might be that guy. You just don't know. But one of those guys this week that you will pick, that is going to get picked up in all likelihood is going to play a huge role in the season. 
Absolutely. That, you're right. That seems to happen every year. And one final guy that we want to talk about, and a guy that could potentially save your fantasy season, if you're sitting there with an RG3 or with oh, a Cam yeah. Newton or with a Tom Brady even, because Tom yep. Brady looked like complete crap, and that's coming from a guy who's wearing a Tom Brady hat right God, now. God, he looked bad. <laughs> um, this is a guy who Dustin and I have both been down on throughout his NFL career. Yep. And he's looked really bad. He's been injured. But he looked amazing on Sunday against Kansas City, and that is Tennessee Titans quarterback Jake Locker. Yep. Locker went 22 of 33 for 266 yards. Two TDs. And, and two TDs, and he probably could have had more if the Titans weren't using their running game to run out the clock in the second yep. half. Exactly. I mean, I really like this guy. I think that he, his two top guys, Kendall Wright and Justin Hunter, I, I think are very, very good receivers. Yeah, Justin um, Hunter looked really good. Justin Hunter is getting crazy physically talented. He's getting ridiculously overhyped by some certain people, but um, I'm not going to throw any under anybody under the bus, <coughs> Ryan. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, Justin Hunter is, he's an absolute beast though. The guy has the physical skills to be in yep. a, a leg, legitimately top 10 receiver. Yeah. Absolutely. And Nate Washington is still there. He can still make And he's still plays. consistent. Yeah. He's one of those guys that you can throw out there every single week from not necessarily a fantasy standpoint, but from a team standpoint, feel pretty yeah. okay. Yeah, and, and that's the thing is you're looking for these kind of guys uh, with with a Jake Locker. And Delaney Walker looked good, too. He made an amazing catch. Yeah. So I, I That mean, wasn't on effect. I mean, even McCluster looked pretty okay in the role he was given. The only guy that looked really bad was Bishop Sankey, but he didn't really have that many touches. It, yep, and that's that's kind of the thing that's interesting in this. It's a new offense, and potentially hunt, yeah. potentially Jake Locker is going to feel a little bit more comfortable. I yep. mean, Wizen Hunt's done a great job in the past reviving certain players. Kurt Warner, careers. Philip Rivers. I mean, yeah, Phillip he's Rivers, he's done yeah. it before with making these quarterbacks. That everyone thought Philip Rivers was cooked a year ago, and then yep. he goes out there and it's like, oh, Philip Rivers has a noodle arm; he can't throw the ball anymore. And he goes out there and has a top five fantasy season. He was incredible last year. Yep. And I don't expect that from Jake Locker, but I certainly, I mean, again, like Nick said, if you have a guy like. Uh, Tom Brady, if you're going to like RG3 and you're like, oh man, I don't feel comfortable at all starting these guys next week, I would totally start Jake Locker. And I would yeah. probably feel fine with it. Just knowing that he has Kendall Wright heavily underrated, Justin Hunter heavily, or heavily underrated, Dexter McCluster, Sean Green, the O-line, well, it looks bad. The talent is there. I think that they can be a somewhat sustainable fantasy offense going forward. Yeah, I, I pretty much agree with that. I, I like Jake Locker as a low-end QB1 potentially wow. going forward i know that sounds crazy but i mean if we're talking about a 12 team 14 team league yeah um i, I don't think health. there are a lot of guys that have a whole lot of better upside yeah i mean yeah, he's gonna rush to too concern. yeah he's gonna rush i mean if, if he, he's gonna get some rushing yards for you too which a lot of qbs just will not get you he's gonna rush he's got wheels yep. it's just and, a matter as if he takes that one wrong hit and it's you're just you know and you just hold your breath the nice thing about a guy like jake locker right now is that even if he does get hurt um, you didn't invest a lot in Yeah, you ain't out nothing. I mean, yeah, you'll still have a guy like Tom Brady RG3, which is terrible for you, but you should never draft those guys to begin with. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, I mean, you ain't out much. You should have drafted Tom Brady if no. you got him as a QB2. No. Come on, Al. Maybe. But, but I mean, I mean I, I, we, he was terrible last year. I mean, straight up. I mean, he was he god-awful. He can't throw the ball anymore. He, he, can't, he can't hit the throws he needs to hit. And I don't know if that's just indicative of, of Cameron Wake and, you know, their offensive line was getting a train wreck, but the offensive line isn't that good to begin with. So, I don't know. But I would be panicking if I had Tom Brady, too, just like RG3. Yep, and I agree. And that's that's the type of situation. If you've got Cam Newton, too. Cam Newton missed week one with the injury. Yeah, and that ain't going to um, go away. He's got broken ribs. Yeah, that's the thing. We don't know what exactly what the situation was, is with Cam Newton going forward. And, I mean... It sounds like, I mean, he looked pretty like he was running around laughing his ass off on the sidelines and stuff. I mean, he looked to be in pretty good spirits, but the thing is, you take one big hit on even bruised ribs. If yeah. you've ever had bruised ribs, oh my gosh, it's yeah, like, he's got broken it's like ribs. you can't breathe. Yeah, and he's got broken and, ribs. Yeah, and he's sitting there nursing broken ribs, and he's going to have to throw with that. He's going to wear I a mean, flak imagine, jacket. But... Imagine that. Imagine stepping back and with broken ribs trying to throw a football down the field. Yeah, that, that running would be incredibly difficult. I'm even more worried about his running potential now going forward yep. now because, I mean, they probably aren't going to risk him at all. Yep. So, I mean, you really, really, I mean, he might be a sell low slash high candidate too, really. Yeah, I, I, don't I, know think, that's, I, I mean, think that's very legitimate. I mean, you and I were, were saying uh, this past week uh, on our show that we did 
that we liked Cam Newton, but only because we were comparing him to like Josh, Josh McCown. McCown. Yeah, it was Josh McCown. And, it looked <laughs> unbelievably freaking bad, but yeah. And 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 the thing was is it, we obviously made that analysis before we knew that Cam Newton wasn't going to play in that game. Right. Obviously, we hope that that person uh, decided to play Josh McCown and at least get some points out of their quarterback position. But um, at, at the end of the day. Cam Newton is somebody who has the physical skills to be a top five fantasy quarterback. He's done it multiple times, but we do not know broken what the situation is with him. And that's why I like a guy like Jake Locker to be your compliment to him. He, yep. You don't have to invest in anything in him, really. You just you get rid of the worst guy off your roster. A lot of people, for whatever reason, decide that they want to the roster two tight ends, roster two yeah. co- defenses, two kickers. Eh, dude, I don't want to get Kimbrell Tompkins. Throw those guys off your roster. Stop it. Aaron Dobson, dude. Get rid of your, do get rid of your Kristen Michaels, okay? Like, yeah. We don't need these guys right now. You don't now, need to be the okay? smartest guy in the room anymore. Just take Jake Locker and see what happens. Exactly. Just roll with Jake Locker this week. See what happens because you're obviously you're in a tough quarterback situation if you're listening to this. So, um, I mean, if this situation is, is uh, one of the ones that you're in with Cam Newton, RG3, Tom Brady, somebody like that. Just go ahead and try out Jake Locker. See what happens. I I think that you're going to be happy with the results. And if he doesn't produce big numbers, you cut him. Yep, I mean, exactly. That, you're now you're out. Nothing. Yeah, you're so out guys, like Aaron Dobson. Exactly. So that's pretty much going to do it this week for this episode of the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you let us know in the comments section below and by hitting that like button. If Also, mm-hmm. if you're new to my channel, make sure that you hit that subscribe button. We're planning on doing plenty of podcasts throughout the season. We're going to try and do two a week if things go well, but uh, we'll see what happens. Now, if you guys have any questions about your lineups this week and you're looking to get any trade advice, any help on the waiver wire, any questions at all about fantasy football, make sure to drop us a note in the comment section below because we would love to answer those questions in our next episode. They will be featured, so uh, definitely do that. We hope you guys had a great week one. Good luck in week two, and be sure to tune in this weekend because we will be back again previewing week two here on the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys so much for listening, and we will talk to you guys again later this week. Bye-bye.